I first would like to thank Norberto for bringing me here. I've learned a lot about epilepsy, of which I know very little. And it also gives me a chance to tell you something about stress, about which I know a little bit more. So I slightly changed the title in Early Life Stress as a Risk Factor for Epilepsy as an example, because I really think that uh, early life stress is a risk factor for many, many different things, including epilepsy. Okay, so let's first introduce a little bit stress. Um, it came up during the first talk this morning, but for the rest of the meeting, it's not been very much highlighted. So anything, any threat that's perceived in the environment, that it can be the external or internal environment, any threat to homeostatic control triggers a stress response. And that's mediated by two big systems, the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system more specifically, and the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And I've depicted in this slide the end products of these um, two axes. Um, under very mild stress conditions, there will be a brief release of noradrenaline in the periphery, but also in the brain. And when an individual is more severely stressed, a moderate stress, also the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis will be activated, resulting in the release of corticosteroids. And that's corticosterone in rodents and cortisol in humans. And what it effectively means for the brain, and that's why I put up this slide, is that cells in the brain are exposed to waves of stress hormones. So first they will see noradrenaline or other catecholamines and peptides. And then slightly later the cells um, are hit by corticosteroids, which have a much uh, longer exposure. And also, <clears throat> it's good to realize, although I didn't bring any cartoon of that, that corticosteroids act through receptors that are transcription factors. So they initiate events that will last for many hours. So although it says here that cells in the brain are exposed for, say, about two hours to stress hormones, the effects on the brain will last much longer. So there's a lot known about what these hormones and um, stress in general is doing at the cellular level. I just made a summary of actually two slides showing what we currently know about stress at the cellular level and what it, we know about the level of cognitive performance. So the important points are that stress releases or gives an enhanced release of a number of hormones, including catecholamines, but also peptides like CRH or ACTH and corticosteroids like corticosterone in rodents, cortisol in humans, and also neurosteroids, which are steroids synthesized in the brain. And there's quite a bit known about what neurosteroids do on uh, epilepsy. I will show mostly effects of corticosteroids, but you should keep in mind that there's always this cocktail of stress hormones affecting the brain. What also will become evident from the talk is that the effects of stress depend on age. So most of the work is done in young, healthy adults, males, human or rats. Um, but you have to bear in mind that the effect of stress on the infant brain can be totally different, and it can be different in the aged brain. So the age is very important, and also the sex is important. Females or males, you may say, see completely different things. So just to summarize 20 years of work, what is corticosterone doing? It's many, doing many things, but I think in relation to epilepsy, it's important to point out that it enhances glutamatergic transmission, for instance, in the hippocampus, the basolateral amygdala, but also in the prefrontal cortex. Um, it can do that very fast through non-genomic effects, and it can do it in a more delayed manner, changing glutamatergic transmission for hours through genomic pathways. Other evidence shows that stress, and more particularly corticosteroids, increase influx of calcium into neurons, particularly through L-type channels. And if you want to know more the details of what stress and corticosteroids are doing and uh, cellular function, 
I refer you to this recent review where we have summarized basically all the literature up to now. It's also very important for structural plasticity. For instance, there are very strong effects of stress on neurogenesis, on the migration of cells, the dendritic complexity. And I just took one example to illustrate that, a paper that just came out, um, where uh, Carlos Fitzsimmons um, used a molecular tool, short hairpin RNA, to knock down the levels of the glucocorticoid receptor, one of the two receptors for corticosterone, specifically in proliferating granule cells in the dentate gyrus. And he showed that whereas normally, let me see how this works. Is there a better pointer maybe? Anyone has a pointer? Well, I can try to do this. So this is the normal pattern of, um, this is the normal pattern of uh, migration. So after building in the virus, uh, which is coupled to a GFP, you see that cells migrate through the granule cell layer. But the interesting thing is if you knock down the GR, you get these very fast migrating neurons that really have a sort of ectopic location. So the glucocorticoid receptor is important for many aspects of structure, including things like migration. So that was about the cellular effects. Uh, what do we know about cognition at this moment? Well, again, this is a summary of a vast amount of uh, papers where um, our lab and also a few other labs looked at what happens directly after stress exposure and a little bit later, say a few hours later, to cognitive function. So it's grouped here according to um, rapid effects, and more delayed effects. And the tests that are listed here are grouped according to tests that really tap on emotional systems all the way down to tests that really look at uh, higher cognitive function, rational decisions. And the summary of all those studies is that directly after stress, so let's say five minutes after stress exposure, especially tasks that involve emotional processing are very much enhanced, whereas the rational ones are suppressed. But interestingly, and I think this is far less known, if you look some hours later, actually there is an improvement in these higher cognitive, rational type of cognitive processing, whereas this is suppressed. And I think both are very beneficial, and that's also why I put in this slide, stress has a very bad connotation. But it's important to understand that it is a tool to adapt to the environment. And both these time domains are adaptive. If you're exposed to stress, you have to do something immediately, which may be not so ben beneficial for future. And then later on, you have to remember what happened to you. You have to remember the correct context in which it happened in order to be prepared for similar conditions later on. So this makes a lot of sense. And all these things at the cellular and at the systems level, they all help the individual to adapt. Having said that, um, yeah, thanks. That's much better. Thank you. Okay. So having said that, stress is very important for adaptive responses to a changing environment. Stress also can be very bad. It can be bad, for instance, when it is taking place repetitively in a, a manner that the individual cannot control the situation. That's very important. It's uncontrollable. And it can also be bad when it's, compare, uh, when it's uh, linked to other challenges like seizures or ischemic in, uh, situations. Or it can be particularly bad during early life. And I put up this... Uh, this graph, because we're talking here about epilepsy, that if you ask patients about um, factors that provoke seizures, the one that's reported most often is actually stress. About 50% of patients, when they are asked to fill out on a questionnaire which factors provoke seizures, they will mention stress. It's usually not very, I mean, it's not entirely reliable, but there are also some studies where people were asked to write that 
um, some moments during the day what they were doing, whether it was stressful, yes or no, and how that, whether they had seizures at that moment or briefly after, whatever. And also under those conditions, there's a reasonable link between stressful events and the occurrence of seizure activity. So a long time ago, we did a couple of studies that really looked at that situation where we changed the levels of corticosteroids and looked how that affected various models of uh, epilepsy. So this is one study, and it was published, I think, more than 10 years ago, where we implanted a pellet with corticosteroids one week before we started hippocampal kindling. So um, the result of the pellet is that the levels of corticosteroids are very high during the kindling phase, but only, mostly during the early phase, not so much later on. And we looked at a number of things, paired field responses after discharges and behavior. And also when the animals were fully kindled, we killed them and we looked at their brain activity in slices. So this is the, the exposure to corticosteroids. As I said, when we start with the kindling, uh, so just before kindling, they have very high levels of corticosteroids as, uh, uh, compared to the placebo group. And then later on, at the end of the kindling session, it was actually much lower. So it was the initial phases of the kindling where corticosteroid exposure was high. And this summarizes the, the behavioral findings, which were quite prominent in the sense that um, it, you can see that if you, if you monitor the classes of the behavioral uh, phenotype, that animals that were exposed to high levels of corticosteroid reached fully kindled stage uh, much faster than the control animals. And when we then looked in fully kindled animals at calcium currents, we observed that in the group that received high levels of corticosteroids, the calcium currents, and that's the black symbols here, were much larger in the ones that were kindled compared to the controls. So there's an overload probably of excitatory transmission, an overload of calcium influx, and all that helps to accelerate the uh, kindling epileptogenesis. We also used another model, which is a rather brutal model, where uh, animals were exposed to ischemia in combination with hypoxia. And what you see is that quite a number of the animals, about 40% of the animals, develop seizures, usually in the first hours after this uh, combination of ischemia hypoxia. And we measured a number of things again, like the field response in the hippocampus, histology, etc. But the important thing is that um, when we tried to intervene with the re release of corticosteroids, we saw very marked effects on seizure uh, probability. So normoxia, of course, we never saw any seizures. In this model for ischemia uh, hypoxia, we saw that about 44% of the animals developed seizures in the first four hours. If you give them extra corticosteroids during this ischemic period, uh, actually more animals would develop this percentage-wise. And then we did two interventions. One is we gave met metyropone, which is a corticosteroid synthesis inhibitor. So these animals developed lower levels of corticosteroid during ischemia, and they were relatively protected uh, for this uh, number of seizures. <clears throat> And also, if we gave the antagonist for the glucocorticoid receptor, we saw that it was also effective in certainly postponing getting uh, seizure activity. So this shows that the level of corticosteroids is really important in adult animals in the propensity to get seizures in models for epilepsy. So this sort of summarizes the way we think about it. An individual is born with a certain genetic background, and that to a large extent determines the brain development so that in adulthood there is a certain brain structure and function, and also the sensitivity to stress hormones is very much determined by the genetic background. But on top of this, of course, comes the environment, and this can be drug treatment, it can be fever, but it can also be stressful events, especially early in life. And that has a very large influence on the brain, and I'll going to show the rest of the talk what it is doing exactly on brain development. And because it has such a large influence, you also have the possibility to intervene with it, and that is what we are currently investigating. So this early life period 
early life stressors are very important because it's a sensitive period of development of the brain. So if you do something there and the brain is exposed to uh, stress hormones, they will have a very important developmental influence which has very long lasting consequences. And for whatever disease you're looking, depression, schizophrenia, alcoholism, but also epilepsy, it turns out that early life stressors are very important in the risk of getting the disease, but also of the, 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 the influence of stress on the severity of the disease. And this is a study that we recently published in Epilepsia from Jolien van Kampen, where uh, we looked in a pediatric sample of 153 children with epilepsy, very diverse background, very diverse treatment. And we asked the children or the parents to fill out a questionnaire to what extent the, uh, se their seizure activity was dependent on stressful uh, situations. And they reported that periods of stress, like for instance a holiday, it can be something positive as well. Um, that, that would give an increase in seizure frequency in about 39% of the children. And also we asked for actual uh, events, like for instance uh, a presentation in school or a fight in school, and they reported that 37% uh, of the children reported that acute stressors would provoke seizures. And all in all, because there was some overlap, half of the children, and this is very similar to the number that I showed you before, half of the children or their parents would indicate that periods of stress or acute stressors would provoke seizure activity. And again, this is not entirely reliable because parents or children may look for causes of the disease. Um, but we're now doing this in a prospective way. So overall, 51% of the children or parents reported stress sensitivity of the seizures. And the interesting thing is that we tried to correlate it with a number of things like the, the drug medication, the type of epilepsy they had, uh, age of onset, uh, number of seizures they had uh, per, per month or so. And the only thing that correlated was the number of life events they had experienced. And some of these are very uh, objective measures like how many times they moved homes, whether they moved uh, to another school, uh, whether they had any major illness apart from epilepsy, etc. So that shows that the early life environment is doing something on the development of the brain and the stress sensitivity to diseases, more specifically epilepsy. So the question is how does early life stress or early life adversity in general change the brain so that it may become more vulnerable to disease later on? So um, we investigate that in animal models because you can very precisely uh, control the environment of the animal. And we use various models, <clears throat> and I'm just going <clears throat> to show you most of the, the data on, on this particular model, although we have used other models. And this is a model that was developed actually by uh, Michael Meany. Um, and the what he uses is the fact that mothers uh, have different maternal um, behavior. Some mothers are very caring and they spend a lot of time on their litter and others sp spend far less time on their litter. There is a natural variation and this, since this is the most, the maternal care is the most important environmental factor in the first postnatal week for rodents, this is, a, is the environment they have early in life. So we scored the licking and grooming of the mothers towards their litter and this is a, actually a picture from, from Michael Meany's group where if you do that over, let's say, 45 litters, you will see a Norman distribution with some mums giving a lot of attention to their litters and some mothers paying very little. And what we do is that we compare the offspring, the adult offspring of the two extremes, so one standard deviation below or above the mean, and we look at their hippocampus, prefrontal, whatever, uh, structure and function. So this is a, a result just that illustrates how big the effects can be. We looked in CA1 and dentate uh, principal cells at the dendritic complexity and the spine density. And I'm just showing you the examples of what it looks like in the picture, but also the, if you do take the averages, it's highly significant. The animals, the adult animals that received a low amount of care from their mother have far less complex C1 pyramidal cells and dendrit granule cells than the ones that got a lot of attention from the mother. And the same is true for the number of spines, the spine density. 
So this has a huge impact. I mean, we're talking about the first postnatal week, and now, three months later, this has a huge impact on the structure of hippocampal cells. And not only the structure, but also the function. So here we try to induce synaptic strengthening by high-frequency stimulation. And you will see that in CA1 area, and also in dentate, which is not on this slide, um, you will have very effective long-term potentiation in the offspring from the high-licking grooming mothers and very poor ability to induce LTP in the offspring of the low-licking grooming mothers. The problem with the model from Michael Meany is that it concentrates only on the extremes. It never looks at the middle group. And it also has a problem of genetic influence because the mothers not only transmit the care, but also the genetic background to the litter. So you would have to cross foster in order to uh, price these two things apart. But we reason that if really the maternal care is important, then the amount of licking and grooming that an individual receives should be the predicting factor, no matter from which mother it comes. And that is exactly what we set out to do. So this, these are studies by Felisa von Hasselt, who actually was looking at the care of each individual pup and used that as a predictor for later structure and function in, amongst others, the hippocampus. So she marked each individual pup in the litter in a unique way so that you could monitor to which pup the mother was paying attention. Each litter would be eight pups, four males, four females. And I think that's important to uh, emphasize that we looked at both males and females. And I think this is an uh, important observation from Felisa because what it shows is that there is a huge variation within one litter in the amount of care that the mother gives to individual pups. So each column here, um, is actually depicting uh, each of these columns. This is one litter. So this is one individual that received a lot of attention, relatively speaking, and this one hardly received any attention from the mother, at least not in the period of time that we were looking. So on average, you may have this high-licking grooming mother that has really her favorite here, but she also has this one that she doesn't like, apparently, and then if you compare it with another mother that on average has a low licking grooming behavior, like for instance this one, this low one is, the amount of licking grooming is very comparable to the higher ones in this mother. So it shows again that the genetic background of the mother is not important. We're just looking at the amount of licking and grooming per mother. Incidentally, if you take the average, you will see that the males receive more attention from the mother on average than the females. And Felisa showed that if you look, for instance, at the expression of the glucocorticoid receptor in the hippocampus, which uh, was also studied at the total litter uh, approach, you can see a nice significant correlation between an amount of licking and grooming that individuals receive during this first postnatal week and the total amount of GR expression. So ones that received very little licking grooming had a low expression, and the ones that received a lot of licking and grooming had a high expression. And at the group level, that was a similar finding, but now you can see it in individuals. And the same is true for the, the degree to which you can induce long-term potentiation in the dentate dryers. So it was a very nice positive correlation between the amount of care received during the first postnatal week, the environment, so to speak, and the degree to which LTP could be induced. Um, for structure, it was less clear. There was, a, um, uh, there was at least a trend in the males for a positive correlation in the dentate gyrus. But interestingly, there was an opposite direction for structure in females. And I think that drives home a point that you always should look at both sexes because you can find very different things. So all this is, these are just a few examples. And it, the bottom line is bad start, doomed forever. Um, this is just a study that I'm involved in in Utrecht where we look in healthy individuals that have filled out a questionnaire about many things, including how they feel at the moment. So we use the, the uh, back depression in inventory. And what you can see here is that the number of, uh, or the childhood environment is actually correlating quite nicely with their subclinical score on this depression scale.
And the same is true for major life events in general and daily hassles and independently of each other, they add to the, to the risk of scoring high on this depression scale. But certainly childhood environment is extremely important. The question mark I put here is because this is a simple message, you know, bad start, forget it, you'll, you're very vulnerable. But that, in general, doesn't seem to be the case. There are a number of things that are important. Are you male or female? Is there still a possibility for intervention? And also the context in which behavior is tested later in life is very important, and I'll show that. So this is a study where we used a different model, so maternal deprivation, postnatal day three for uh, 24 hours. And here we looked at um, day 22, post weaning, or day 21. Um, and we looked at neurogenesis in the dentate. An interesting thing that you can see here is that you find opposite things in males and females. So these were deprived of the mother for 24 hours. We look a few weeks later. In the females, you see a very strong uh, reduction in the neurogenesis compared to the controls. And, but in the males, you actually see an increase. And there are two more groups here because people always say, well, if you deprive the animals from the mother, they also don't eat. Uh, so we also gave them sucrose, but that doesn't change the picture. So males and females, you can, can find different things. The good news is also that effects can be reversed. This is a protocol where we basically looked at the same parameter. I mean, we're looking at many different things, but I'm just showing you the neurogenesis data. So again, they're maternally deprived of postnatal A3. Now we look at postnatal A29 um, to see whether this effect persists. And also, we treat them with a glucocorticoid receptor antagonist during early puberty to see whether we can reverse those effects on neurogenesis. And that's indeed the case. So no maternal deprivation, you see a number of double cortin positive neurons, which is an indication for neurogenesis. If you maternally deprive the animals, you will see that there's a huge reduction in the number of uh, DCX positive cells. And if you now give them three days of the glucocorticoid receptor antagonist, you completely reverse the phenotype and they're actually quite normal. And we also look at behavioral uh, data and also at later time points. And it's very powerful to prevent those glucocorticoid receptor effects. Um, the third point that I mentioned was the context during which you test animals in adulthood. Remember that I showed that if you look in the basal conditions at long-term potentiation, that the offspring from the high-licking grooming mothers had very effective LTP, whereas the ones that were from the low-licking grooming mothers had very low LTP. But if you give them corticosteroids in adulthood and then look, so basically what you mimic is that you have a certain early life environment, and now you test the animals under stressful conditions in adulthood, what you will see is that the offspring of the high licking grooming mothers has a low uh, ability to induce LTP. But the really interesting thing is that the offspring of the low licking grooming mother, if you now give them corticosteroids, you mimic stress situations, they have a very high probability to induce LTP. So the, the way we look at it is that you, w the situation in which the animals grow up early in life primes brain to f function optimally under co comparable conditions later on. When there is a mismatch between those two environments, that is the situation where problems may arise. So um, this is actually also reflected in behavior. So non-stressful behavior, the low licking grooming offspring is doing very poorly. But for instance, when you test them in a very f uh, stressful learning condition, in this case, contextual fear memory, you will see that actually their memory, their freezing, is, is much enhanced compared to the offspring from the high-looking grooming mother. And actually there was a, a comment uh, on this paper um, where they said uh, mothering, not smothering. So a certain amount of maternal care, in rodents at least, seems to be very good. It should not be too much because then the animals are not doing very well under very stressful conditions later in life. The picture also shows that, uh, and I think it's actually, this illustrates it very nicely, uh, 
that when you have a combination of a bad start with highly excitable or highly stressful conditions later in life, that that is a situation where the hippocampus may really start to be hyperexcitable. So uh, the point I really want to make is that it's important when you have that early life environment that you also look under basal conditions in adulthood as well as stressful conditions to get the full picture. So with all this in, uh, in the memory, uh, we actually have recently started, and I can only show you some preliminary data, to look at what the effect is of early overexposure to corticosteroids on epileptogenesis. And we used a, not a genetic uh, susceptibility, but we used a hyperthermia model as a sort of a first hit, which is a very subtle model. And then we start to expose animals either to high levels of corticosteroids or to various stressors. Of course, the last situation is much more interesting, but as a first uh, approximation, we started with giving corticosteroids. So we use this uh, complex experimental fibro seizure model where spontaneous seizures can develop after a latent period, but you really have to look at the EEG. It's not very overt. They have a decreased seizure threshold. Uh, excited transmission has been shown to be uh, facilitated. There are also some morphological changes. But again, this is an extremely subtle model. And I have to say, when we look in the younger animals, we don't see very much difference between the uh, normothermia and hypothermia animals. So the experimental design of the first series that I'm going to show you some results of is that we do hypothermia or normothermia at postnatal day 10. And then uh, after that, they get every other day uh, in dose of corticosteroids or vehicle. And we test in this case the animals at an early age, postnatal day 25. Um, but we also would like to look at later time points. And in the very last slide, I'll show the design for that. So what we're looking at for the moment, because we base ourselves on what we have seen with uh, corticosteroid exposure in general, we're looking at structural plasticities, things like neurogenesis, dendritic complexity, spine density, and also ectopic location of dendritic granule cells. But I'm sure we're going to transfer when we you know, progress in this uh, study to other areas as well, because we know, for instance, from the earlier studies that I showed you that especially the prefrontal cortex is extremely sensitive to early life stress. We look at massive fiber sprouting and also functional plasticity, looking at glutamatergic transmission and LTP. I'm just going to show you a few data. So this is the looking at glutamatergic transmission in dentate granule cells. We look at spontaneous glutamatergic events, so that's the release of one vesicle containing glutamate, uh, either due to the arrival of a spontaneous action potential or just spontaneous fusion of one of these vesicles. And then we also look at miniature uh, excited postsynaptic currents where action potentials are completely blocked, and this is just a spontaneous fusion of vesicles. And um, so we have four experimental groups here. Uh, one is the normothermia vehicle, the normothermia that received corticosteroids, the hypothermia vehicle, and the hypothermia corticosteroid. And it was actually the, the group where we saw a significant difference was the group that received hypothermia either with or without corticosteroid. And what we're depicting here is the area under the curve was this um, spontaneous excitatory event. We also looked at the um, uh, miniature EPSC. In this case, I'm going to show you data on the interval. And what we saw was that there was an interaction between uh, the uh, hypothermia and corticosteroid treatment. And the groups actually that had the shortest intervals were the ones that, um, this is the control group, and this is the group uh, is this correct? So, no, sorry, this is the control group, and this is the group that had hypothermia uh, in combination with corticosteroids, had a relatively short interval, and a combination of having a short interval with a larger in amplitude would suggest that there is slightly more uh, excitability going on. Um, we also looked at massive fiber sprouting. This is a more uh, semi-quantitative uh, way of looking, so three people independently scored the values. It was quite subtle again. Um, what we saw, especially in CA3 area, was that the group that received hypothermia 
in combination with corticosteroids actually had significantly more sprouting than any of the other groups. So analysis is still ongoing. We are also looking at dendritic complexity, to what extent cells are located either on the outside or the inside of the granular cell layer, and all this uh, is in progress. I want to mention a final uh, study that we just started with someone from here, Eduardo, who is uh, spending a year in our lab, and he's actually making the next step where I think in a more interesting situation where we expose animals again to hypothermia and normothermia, so extremely subtle model, and then after that we give them various stressors in an unpredictable manner, so they, um, well, it's predictable to us, but it's not predictable to the animals. Um, and then he's looking at two time points, so one is here, uh, the same time point that I showed you before, so directly 24 hours after the last stressor, but he's also looking in, in uh, young adult animals, three months of age, to see how the brain is developing. And he's going to look at a number of the same parameters as I mentioned in the previous uh, series, so structural plasticity, dendritic complexity, spine density, and ectopic location, mossy fiber sprouting. And also, he's more interested uh, in his project uh, in the functionality of the stress system, so he's going to look at how the stress system develops with this combination of uh, hypothermia and being ex exposed to a number of stressors after this hypothermic event, which I think, you know, relates to the situation in humans where the child is having uh, high fever seizures and then the parents are very upset and the child is very upset in the weeks after that event. So just to summarize um, some of the work we've done, stress is the most frequently reported precipitant of seizures, in, both in adults and in children, as we showed. We're currently performing a prospective studies where children have a diary uh, making notes of what happens to them during the day and also their seizure frequency. And we're testing in these children uh, how their stress system is working. So the, the, the hypothesis would be that the ones that are very sensitive to stress in terms of their epilepsy are also maybe ones that are very sensitive to stress in general, that they just respond stronger to the same stress situation. Especially stress during early life has lasting effects on hippocampal structure and function, even at the level of single pups. And I mentioned here hippocampus, but we have looked at other parts of the brain as well. And as I said, between the lines, especially actually the prefrontal cortex seems to be extremely sensitive to stress early in life. And you can see that there is effects on complexity of dendritic trees, spines, neurogenesis, everything. And this is a lasting effect. So it happens early in life, but it changes the brain forever. Uh, you can see it in uh, electrical activity. You can see it in behavior. And in general, um, it changes the brain such that under non-stressful conditions, the animals are not doing very well, but they may do better under stressful conditions. So preliminary evidence, and I should really emphasize that this is very preliminary, uh, shows that the predisposition for epilepsy, in this case, female seizures, in combination with corticosterone overexposure may promote epileptogenesis, but this is really, I think, early days. So I th should thank the people that really did the work. So we are fortunate in Utrecht that we have groups working both in the basic neuroscience, in psychiatry and neurology. So this is a co-production. And I would also like to acknowledge people from Amsterdam, Leiden, Canada, and even Brazil um, for our collaborations and some of the work that I showed. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>